One of the beautiful things about Star Wars, and all fictional universes, is that it gives us an escape from reality with the fantastical, epic things that happen in-universe. Every child who grew up with Star Wars probably imagined themselves as a Jedi or Sith, a fighter pilot, or even a clone trooper in the GAR. But, just like in our world, the entirety of the Star Wars universe wouldn't function if this were the only kind of profession. In order for the pilots and the admirals and the chancellors to be able to do their thing, there were thousands of other people in support roles, ensuring everything was in place for the people in the limelight to shine. In today's video, we'll be taking a look at an off-neglect aspect of Star Wars. The mundane, day-to-day -day people that formed the backbone of galactic society. At the same time, we'll be answering the question of what a regular 9-to-5 job would look like in the Star Wars universe. So, with no further ado, let's dive right into the lower and middle class lives and see what they were up to. Attention, Sergeant on deck! Amongst the most important kinds of jobs were those related to agriculture. In a galaxy full of quadrillions of people, there was a continuous, urgent need for food production. This was especially true for highly urbanized worlds like Coruscant or Corellia, which relied on food being imported from distant agri-worlds like Tanab, Yukio, and Telos to sustain their monstrous populations. Without the work of farmers, galactic civilization would have never been able to grow the way it had, and population centers like Coruscant would have either starved to death or never developed to that degree of urbanization. In this category, we're not just counting the typical farmers like the ones you might find on Tanab, tending to crops manually, or with the use of droids. Across the galaxy, there were several different types of agriculture, all of which were key to the population they sustained surviving. Take moisture farmers, for example. Vapor farmers, as they were also known, were individuals who operated a moisture farm on arid or desert worlds, such as Tatooine or Behiboth. These moisture farms boasted large structures known as vaporators that could extract excess moisture from the atmosphere and condense it into stores of liquid water. On these scorching worlds, rainfall was either scarce or non-existent, and moisture farming was the only way to sustain life on the planet. On Behiboth, for example, when a group of brigands began targeting the local moisture farmers around 27 ABY, their antics almost destabilized the entirety of the human colonies on the planet. Another obvious type of farmer were the various types of livestock keepers. This is where you would see your average nerf herder or bantha herder. In a similar vein, hunters such as fishermen or yagi men didn't raise their own livestock, but hunted for food. As you might imagine, meat was a staple in many cultures and planets, and that meat had to come from somewhere. Having enough food to eat wasn't the only thing an average galactic citizen had to worry about. On some planets like Coruscant, even breathing wasn't something you could take for granted. Even in our own world, engineers and maintenance workers are critical to pretty much everything working correctly. If you get on a train to commute to work, you have both to thank for your commute going smoothly. But in Star Wars, these support staff played an even more critical role. You see, Part of galactic history focused heavily on exploring and colonizing new worlds, many of which were inhospitable in one way or another. In other cases, colonized worlds slowly became inhospitable over time, calling for a need to build and maintain the basic systems that allowed those worlds to sustain life. Let's take a look at Coruscant, which was a prime example of such a planet. As you might remember from our video on the Republic's capital world, Coruscant had multiple systems in place to allow for Coruscant City to function. One such system was the Orbital Solar Energy Transfer Satellites, also known as the Orbital Mirrors, that concentrated warmth and sunlight from Coruscant's small sun onto the planet's surface. This not only gave Coruscant more daylight, but it also raised the surface temperature by a few degrees to allow for a more hospitable climate. Next were the Atmospheric Scrubbers, which flew above the galactic capital and continuously purified the air. Without these scrubbers, Coruscant's atmosphere would have quickly become so polluted that life would have practically ceased to exist, or everyone would have had to walk around wearing gas masks 24-7. Coruscant also boasted its own weather control system, a system that essentially created an artificial temperature climate. 
Another thing to consider were Coruscant's thousands of levels. With such a staggering engineering problem to overcome, the Acumenopolis engineers had constructed systems to transport water, clean air, and electricity throughout the levels, usually at the expense of the lower levels. Water in particular was pumped all over the city from the polar ice caps, supplying drinking water to the city and filling the basins of massive artificial seas and lakes. Without these life support systems in place, Coruscant City would have ground to a halt. Even looking beyond Coruscant, many other planets showed a need for engineering structures that combated their environment. Whether those were the doomed cities of Mandalore or the underwater structures of Manan, every planet needed constant maintenance and support for the rest of its citizens to be able to live the life they thought was normal. Much like engineers, there are three other professions that are high-profile jobs in both our worlds and the Star Wars universe, though their applications are a little different. The first of these would be programmers and slicers, who, much like IT workers in our society, were critical in ensuring galactic society could continue to function. The reason is fairly obvious. In a society heavily reliant on technology, droids and computers, programmers were the engineers of the digital world that designed and maintained the framework of society. On an everyday level, most of what an average citizen used in a day relied on technology and, as a result, had to have had a programmer involved in its creation. It's staggering to think how many things in the Star Wars universe required programming, from the mechanical doors in most buildings, to the speeders used for transportation, to the holonet, to elevators and comms links and hollow displays. In more specialist fields, programmers were the core team that built most advanced tech, from farming droids to mining droids to assassin droids, super weapons, tanks, spaceships, laser weapons and so on, programmers were essential. Especially the militaries of the galaxy used them to build their various systems. As a result, programmers were highly employable. We're willing to bet most worked a very normal 9-to-5 job in office buildings, such as the ones we see on Corellia. Others worked on-site, such as the programmers on board the Death Star while the battle station was being built. Either way, programmers had the unfortunate privilege of knowing exactly how something was built, which made them valuable targets of rival corporations, and even targets their own employers, if a particularly nasty boss ever began feeling someone might jump ship and leave the company with critical intel in their noggins. Speaking of less conscientious employers, there was another aspect of the IT field in Star Wars. Slicing. Slicers were, to put it in our terms, the hackers of the Star Wars universe. Their skills allowed them to break into computer systems and databases and recover encrypted information they could then decrypt and pass on to whoever was employing them. As you can imagine, slicing was incredibly dangerous if you got caught and incredibly profitable if you didn't. Every organization in the criminal underground had slicers on their payroll, as did every military. In times of war, slicing could liberate critical intel belonging to the enemy, and in times of peace, it could help liberate funds or steal the blueprint to something valuable. Unlike programmers, who could live a relatively normal life, slicers were in far more danger in their day-to-day -day life. Sometimes, data or computers were given to them to decrypt in the comfort of their home base, but oftentimes, they had to infiltrate an enemy facility and directly slice into a terminal. This brought up the mortality rate significantly, but for computer-savvy individuals with high-risk tolerance, it could be a very lucrative career. But there was another type of job that was crucial in society, and one without which neither programmers nor engineers could do their own work. Mechanics. Just like in our world, even if someone comes up with an idea and designs a product, someone else still has to build it. That's where mechanics come in. A great example is Pelimoto from The Mandalorian, the mechanic who builds and repairs his ship. And given how everyone in Star Wars had some form of personal vehicle, whether that was a land speeder or a spacecraft, mechanics were a highly sought-after profession. They also had the task of building and maintaining droids, which society heavily relied on. In that sense, mechanics were one of the people that average citizen would actively have to reach out to fix their stuff which is why so many could maintain independent shops, 
even on desert worlds like Tatooine. And honestly, this has to have been one of the safest, most normal jobs to have in a galaxy as crazy as this. Mechanics could show up to work, build or repair whatever was bought in, and in most cases, not have to worry about things like gang or syndicate activity, which power was in control of the planet, and whether or not they were working on a super weapon. All in all, it was a great way to make a living. And, naturally, there were also medical personnel to treat the sick and injured. Doctors in the Star Wars universe were simultaneously blessed and cursed. They had thousands of alien physiologies to deal with instead of just the one, but they also had access to technology that trivialized much of their jobs. There were hospitals in Star Wars like any other world, and the medical personnel were heavily reliant on bioscanners and medical droids to get the job done. Even much of their work was facilitated by things like Colto tanks and Bacta tanks, which handled the healing for them. In fact, we've seen instances where the medical personnel are less doctors in charge and more droid supervisors. A good example of this would be Camino's cloning facilities, where the staff ran tests but left a lot of the diagnosing and actual treatment to the AZ-class droids. Of course, that didn't make them any less valuable. Doctors saved lives on a daily basis, technology or no, and for that, we'd like to think they were well compensated. However, looking at how public healthcare treats most doctors in our world, we're not entirely sure about that one. Then, of course, we have another crucial form of resource gathering that was, in some ways, even more crucial to the galactic industrial machine than food. Mind resources. Even in our world today, mining accounts for some of the world's most valuable minerals. The Star Wars galaxy was no different. There were many minerals that could only be acquired through mining, many of which were necessary for the most basic technologies to function. Take coaxium, for example. Mined in the underground mines of the planet Kessel, this substance, also known as hypermatter, was one type of hyperfuel that allowed ships to travel through hyperspace. Similarly to this, Tabana gas was mined on gas giants such as Bespin and served as a coolant for ships travelling through hyperspace. Without substances like this, light speed wouldn't be possible, crippling almost every aspect of interstellar activity. Other minerals unique to Star Wars were all the different varieties of energy crystal, such as Iralum, Furkran, Darmind and Nextor, all of which had various applications in technology. And finally, we would be remiss if we didn't at least mention the infamous spice mines of Kessel. These nightmarish underground caverns were filled with the webs of spice spiders, which unfortunate miners had to venture into and collect. These webs would then be refined into glitter stim, one of the most potent varieties of spice. Since we've mentioned refineries, we'll include them in this segment even if they are technically an entirely different category. Most mined minerals and substances were useless in their crude form, or so unstable they couldn't be stored. Refineries were necessary to convert most of the raw material into usable forms, whether that was extracting and storing Tabana gas in Cloud City's gas refineries, or transforming the spice spiderwebs into glitter stim. Without people toiling away in these refineries, most mining products would go to waste, and many staples such as hyperspace travel would be impossible. Speaking of space travel, there was a lot more needed to make it possible than just the fuel itself. Another aspect of daily Star Wars life that few seem to give much thought to is the day-to-day -day running of a typical spaceport, and how, without dedicated employees running the place, there would be a lot more casualties. Again, we can draw parallels to our own world. Every single airport from the tiniest island facility to the huge hubs like LAX or Singapore airports, need to have air control personnel that plan, guide and coordinate aircraft that are preparing for landing or takeoff. Both the airspace and the runway of an important are finite, and with dozens of planes potentially moving at any given time, air traffic control plays the critical role of preventing accidents from occurring. When we adjust the above example for an average Star Wars spaceport, it gets exponentially worse. When looking at an Ecumenopolis like Nar Shaddaa or Coruscant, 
it's sometimes difficult to mentally grasp just how huge their populations really were. Coruscant, for example, is credited at hosting 1 trillion people, but if we're being realistic, the number would be multitudes higher. Add to that how central both planets were to trade, travel and politics, there's no doubt there were thousands of spacecraft arriving or departing. While it's true that, with Starship's thrusters capable of lowering a spacecraft without the need of a runway, the numbers were just so much higher than the daily traffic even the largest of Earth's airports get that air traffic control would have been critical in ensuring there weren't too many casualties. Simultaneously, air traffic control was responsible for receiving clearance codes where they were needed. They also segregated incoming vessels based on the ship's designations, sending cargo-bearing vessels towards the commercial area for inspection, whereas personnel craft was sent elsewhere. They also coordinated cargo inspections, and, of course, spaceports also had security personnel that were there to prevent dangerous cargo from being brought in or any dangerous persons from walking freely through the streets. Many of these staff members worked for the Bureau of Ships and Services, who had inspectors and officials at most starports and whose organization was the true ultimate power in the universe. Overall, spaceport personnel not only kept the rivers of commerce flowing smoothly by coordinating incoming ships, but also assisted in the transportation of everyday citizens and worked to keep their communities safe. As much as shows like Star Wars Rebels or Andor show them being entirely incompetent, as a general rule, they did their job well, and without them, many aspects of interstellar travel and trade would be significantly more difficult and dangerous. Speaking of trade and commerce, there's another aspect of Star Wars we were lucky to catch a glimpse of in the Republic Commando novels – accounting. Now, this is precisely the sort of profession we meant to look at today. Accounting is probably one of the most boring, least glamorous professions, and yet it's absolutely necessary if you want your company to not go bankrupt. To put it briefly, accountants can serve several functions for a company. Some examples are reviewing financial statements and other reports to make sure they're accurate, performing account reviews and audits, preparing tax returns and so on. Now, we hear you. Most of the corporations we see in-universe are some of the most corrupt institutions we could ever imagine. And it's true, most corporations that make an appearance are usually the bad guys in the story. We're looking at you, Zerkar. However, not all companies were like that. For every Zerkar, there were millions of smaller businesses that were just trying to get by. And, even when we got to the hugely corrupt corporations, you'd still want an accountant. If you're the sort of chairman that would embezzle millions of credits, you'd want to be sure other people weren't embezzling, wouldn't you? And that's where accountants came in. From what we can see in the Republic Commando books, accountants on Coruscant weren't rich, but they made enough to afford a small but comfortable apartment alone. They also made enough to afford some leisure time, even if that wasn't spent on luxuries. That said, the woman portrayed in the books, Bessany Wenin, was unfortunately an auditor working with government agencies on Coruscant during the Clone Wars. This put her in a truly unfortunate position of accidentally stumbling across one of Palpatine's conspiracies, which led to her needing to flee for her life. Naturally, she was in no position to uncover the Supreme Chancellor's corruption. With how much corruption was going around in giant megacorporations of Star Wars, we wouldn't be surprised if this was a frequent occurrence. Accountants likely had to navigate the treacherous waters of which embezzlements to uncover and when to keep their mouths shut, which is more stress than we'd like in our day-to-day -day lives. Speaking of stress, there was an entire industry that catered to that, and it was likely one of the largest employers of the galaxy. Every single Star Wars show has gone out of its way to show us how people relaxed in-universe, from commoners lounging in cantinas to the extremely wealthy. With entire planets dedicated to what we might consider leisure and pleasure activities, trillions across the galaxy were employed in the service industry one way or another. Consider planets like Zeltron, where the vast majority of the planet's industry was dedicated to things like gambling, red rooms, pod racing, dancing, drinking, and other unsavory activities. In casinos, you would see more or less what you'd expect in our world. 
dealers, exchange personnel, bouncers, bartenders, dancers, and security. But casinos aren't the only things people could visit to let off some steam. Red Rooms are one of the oldest establishments in the world, and we won't go into them too much, but they existed, especially in places like Narshadar's Red Light District. There were also strip clubs, where it was common for attractive people to put on dances. Certain alien species, such as Twi'lek, were very desirable as dancers, and they were fairly universally considered to be attractive, and people of both genders could be found in most large establishments, in person or over hollow. Other more reputable establishments, like clubs, bars, restaurants, and so on, were very much a thing, and places your average citizen would go to let off some steam. That said, these were all some of the more legal options for entertainment. There are a few other options we're going to discuss separately, one of which was mostly legal, while the other was mostly illegal. We're pretty sure you've all heard of the former, pod racing. As a sport, it was one of the more popular forms, much like rally racing is in our world. Although races could be held on any planet in the galaxy as long as there was space for a track, there were a few that were infamous for it. Malastare was notorious for its pod racing circuits, and everyone remembers Little Anakin racing on Tatooine in Episode 1. Other planets with a reputation for pod racing were Kurgans, Thuron, and Cantonica. Some of these, like Malastare and Tatooine, held races across the wide open terrain, while others, like Kurgans and Cantonica, had a more urban setting. Across the galaxy, there were millions who tried their hand at pod racing. Racers with talent could amass large amounts of wealth and fame, as races were frequently broadcast across the galaxy. Those with exceptional talent could even earn sponsors in the form of well-off figures, like huts. As sources like Knights of the Old Republic let us know, participating in races cost an upfront fee, but winning earned you multitudes in return. The more you won, the more access you had to higher-value races, which could boost both your reputation and fortune as a racer. That said, pod racing came with great risks. Episode 1 made it clear that Anakin was the only human racing around that time, and this was for a good reason. Pod racers hit ridiculously dangerous speeds during a race, and combined with the constant sabotage attempts and open attacks other racers initiated during a race, Lightning-fast reflexes were pretty much mandatory if you wanted to survive a lap, never mind an entire race. And, even for non-humans, racing was still incredibly dangerous. As we just mentioned, during most races, competitors were not only allowed but encouraged to actively try to harm the other people on the track. Many pod racers came equipped with various weapons, including laser weapons, magnetic locks, shields, and other ways to sabotage your opponents. Pod racing was, after all, a spectator sport, and the fun wasn't just in seeing who would win, but also in seeing who would make it to the end. With that in mind, the life of a pod racer on a day-to-day -day basis was likely fairly benign in between races. For the most famous, their earnings would be enough for them to comfortably live off without needing an actual job. For those trying to break into the sport, they would most likely have another job so they could save up the credits needed to kit out their pod racers and pay the race fees. And, of course, we'd be remiss if we didn't at least mention some illegal activities, such as drug manufacturing and distribution. We've already gone over the various stages of drug production, so we'll look at the other side here. On almost every world in the galaxy, there were people and organizations that focused on distributing illegal substances. Some of these, such as the various types of spice and stims, could be sold through cartels or even your average no-name street dealer, which were known as slithmongers in the Star Wars universe. In other places, like Zeltron, these substances weren't as illegal as they were on other, more reputable worlds. The Zeltrons were well known for their aphrodisiacs, as well as some substances that, to put it nicely, could create an instant physical attraction towards a person, circumnavigating the need for actual consent. What's interesting is that, in a galaxy as wide as this, many normal, everyday things could be addictive. This was the case with the Arconia, an alien species that could grow addicted to table salt. The Republic made great effort to prevent salt from reaching their world, but salt dealers found ways to get salt to the Arconia anyway, 
leading to a huge salt problem on the planet. In cases like that, of course, the operations were run mostly by larger cartels or syndicates, which brings us to the next career choice for our average galactic citizen. Over the millennia, thousands of gangs, syndicates and cartels popped up to populate the galaxy's underground scene. Organizations like Black Sun, the Pike Syndicate, the Hutt Cartel, the Justicars, and many more ran operations across hundreds of planets. As we've already mentioned, Spice was one of their main wares. The Book of Boba Fett shows us how much Spice the Pikes moved across worlds like Tatooine, while places like Nar Shaddaa were run by the Hutt Cartel. However, this wasn't their only field of operation, not by a long shot. Cartels and other criminal organizations were heavily active in the black market, smuggling weapons, intelligence, and even people where they weren't supposed to go. Many were involved in the slave trade, which was illegal in much of the galaxy. Additionally, they worked security, providing protection to various people at a steep cost, voluntary or not. And finally, they were of course involved in various crimes of violence, such as battery, burglary, theft, and even assassination. People working for these criminal organizations could have a variety of jobs, from working for their manufacturing facilities to security, distribution, enforcement, logistics, and even negotiation. As a consequence of working for these criminal groups, no employee would ever feel truly safe. Gang or cartel operations were always at risk of being targeted by the law or other rival organizations. Even those on the lower end of the food chain, your regular goons, were at a daily risk of being mowed down by someone looking to shut down an operational facility. And even if they weren't being specifically targeted, the clients they often had to deal with were less than friendly, which resulted in many workplace accidents. And that's not even taking into consideration that you were always at risk of running afoul of your own employer. Season 3 of The Bad Batch brought us an example of Pike Syndicate Justice, where the trial was performed by the leading Pike family of the area, and the dependents were summarily dropped into a pit of death for crossing the syndicate. But that was reality working for the criminal underground there was always danger, which is why the next category of jobs were invaluable to the galaxy, even if canon often makes them look more useless than anything else. Like every community ever, Star Wars regarded security as a major priority. For the better part of history, even the larger powers that were, like the Galactic Republic and the Hutt Empire, didn't maintain a unified force, like a grand army. The Clone Wars did eventually see the emergence of the GAR and the CIS droid army, but even they emerged out of the consolidation of the Planetary Security Forces, or PSFs, which is what we'll be focusing on now. PSFs were the various forces, such as police and military, that, as a unit, served to protect a community. In Star Wars, each PSF usually protected a single planet, hence the name. In some cases, they were organized by the planetary governments, like the Coruscant Guard. In others, they were funded by megacorporations, like the Trade Federation, which created these PSFs as a means of protecting their various financial assets, or occasionally enforcing embargoes on other planets. For the most part, anyone working in a security force dealt with very typical day-to-day -day crime. Thefts, murders, busting smuggling operations and trafficking rings. The PSFs protected civilians from each other, but also from larger organizations that were happy to harm them as collateral damage. A great example of this was when, during the Great Galactic War, the Sith Empire attacked Corellia. Paid off by the Imperials, a criminal army occupied the Black Hole Industrial Area, where Corellia produced and stored the hypermatter its fleets and shipyards relied upon. In response, the Corellian security forces swarmed the area, setting up an HQ and launching different operations to drive the Imperials and their criminal army off their planet. On a similar note, when the Trade Federation set up an embargo around Nabu, then invaded Nabu's own defense corps, the Royal Nabu security forces rose to the challenge of liberating their planet and protecting civilians from becoming collateral damage. Of course, these security forces weren't only used for defense, when the need or government called for it, these forces were used as an army that would attack or invade other planets. 
For example, during the al sakan conflicts, Coruscant and al sakan went to war, and the armies they relied on were their own PSFs. Overall, the life of someone working in a security force most likely involved a combination of police work and army work, either defending against invasions, fighting against other planets, or being stationed somewhere to keep guard. We'd like to think that, excluding periods of extreme unrest like the Clone Wars or the Galactic Wars, they mostly dealt with petty crimes. Speaking of petty crimes, we do have to mention the smugglers, who made a living smuggling illegal goods and people into places they shouldn't be. Sometimes, this could be as simple as transporting spice onto worlds where it was banned. Other times, it could be smuggling weapons or supplies onto a world under a hostile government to support the local resistance forces. Famous examples would be Han Solo or Hondo Anaka, but for every famous smuggler, there were thousands of nobodies handling small, petty crimes and violating galactic laws. Pilots, on the other hand, did the same job, just legally. We've agreed to leave out the exciting aspects, like starfighter piloting, so we'll just look at the mundane things pilots got up to. Naturally, there were transport shuttles to be piloted, cargo vessels, maintenance ships, and even scientific shuttles that gathered data for various studies. That said, there were times when the only thing that differentiated a pilot from a smuggler was what was in their cargo hold. At least, compared to our own universe, becoming a pilot wasn't nearly as difficult. Flying spacecraft wasn't something elite, though there were certainly differences between those who could do it and those who could do it well. Even then, the average citizen could easily become one if they just had access to a ship, and if we set aside the dangers of flying, it seems like it would have been a fairly easy job, assuming you weren't boarded by pirates or shot out of the sky. And finally, with all that said, there's one final category of people we need to talk about, and these people didn't count as professionals. We're talking, of course, about droids and slaves, untold millions of whom were put to work in many of the professions we've already discussed. However, Unlike your average galactic citizen who was hired on to do these tasks, both droids and slaves were not only uncredited, but unpaid, unprotected, and heavily exploited in every sense of the term. Unfortunately, regardless of the era and often even the galactic power in question, there was always some form of slavery upholding the foundations of society. Even though the Galactic Republic claimed to be against slavery, it still set droids to work without ever acknowledging even the most basic of droid rights. Without the unpaid labour of the two, the economy would have been drastically different, which is enough to leave a bitter taste in your mouth no matter how fantastically the universe might otherwise be. Naturally, this isn't an exhaustive list of all the different jobs people in the Star Wars universe might have. In a galaxy as large as this, there were thousands of jobs someone could have, but we tried to go over some of the major ones without which galactic society would essentially cease to function. But what do you think? Are there any major mundane day jobs we should have mentioned? If you had to be a mundane civilian living in the Star Wars universe, what job would you like to have? Feel free to let us know in the comments down below.